Hello and welcome uh, everyone to the uh, another episode of uh, Conversations on Business of Retail where we talk to uh, retail leaders who have built uh, large businesses through their perseverance, through their persistence, their vision and their uh, you know ability to carry along everyone together. Today we have uh, a very very young and very successful uh, leader Siddhant Keshwani who is the founder and uh, CEO of Libas. Welcome Siddhant. Hello, hi everyone. So I'm Siddhant Keshwani, a founder and CEO of Libas. So I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, so journey, I mean, it has seen a lot of ups and downs uh, since I started nine years back. And of course, the industry that I opted for was e-commerce and it was fairly new back in the day when I started. And I came with zero experience of e-commerce and I think e-commerce was fairly small uh, back in the day. So, I mean, my journey really started, uh, so th at that time, this was I think around 2014. So, I think the only e-commerce business that was happening in our country was actually on marketplaces like Flipkarts, Mintras and Amazon had also just started I think around the same time in 2014 in India. So, uh, industry was fairly new and of course, even when we were looking at hiring teams, there were not many people who came with a good kind of an experience in e-commerce because the industry on its own was fairly new back in the day. So uh, when I started, we started with a very simple formula that okay, uh, marketplaces is something that we should start and uh, we wanted to pick a category. So I did about one year of research before I actually went live and uh, to get proof of concept. So uh, I, when, when I was doing the studies and uh, when I was trying to understand what would be the right product fit. Uh, my first instance, instant reaction was that I definitely need a product that people buy again and again. So uh, I did a lot of brainstorming as what is it that people really buy again and again. So then I realized the gender that really buys again and again is women. So I think that was my first tick mark that have to do something in the space of women because they tend to shop slightly more than men. And, uh, and then the next challenge was to find a category that they shop the most. So after I did my research, uh, I actually found out that office wear as a category was really growing because the corporate culture in our country was rapidly increasing around that time and, uh, and people were actually moving away from ethnic wear and moving towards western wear at that time. So I realized that we need to come up with a product which is more office specific and need to modernize how people look at uh, Indian wear. So that's how the journey really started. So we said, okay, let's experiment, let's launch like 100 options and uh, in small quantities and see. And to our surprise, within one week, 10 days, we sold out of our inventory. And that gave us the confidence that the product market fit is good. We've got uh, proof of concept also. And that's how we started pressing onto the accelerator. We scaled up our marketplace business rapidly. Then around COVID, D2C was the thing that was the, that was the hot thing that time. Uh, we launched a D2C platform also back in 2019 or so and since then we've become a complete end-to-end -end uh, omni-channel brand. So that's how the journey of Libas has been so far. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. Uh, so, uh, you know, my first question always to uh, leaders is uh, what is your personal uh, definition of success? See, for me, I think uh, when you're building a brand, there are two ways people look at it. One is by selling and one is by building a brand. They are two completely different things. If for me success is when you are known. So today for me I think the biggest success is that when I actually uh, take out the data across marketplaces or Google and all. So Libas is actually one of the highest searched brands organically. So I think to me that has been the biggest success that we have actually been able to leave a mark in the industry where people are now looking for us. So there was a time when we were hunting for customers, right? There was things like customer acquisition cost and uh, we were going out looking at newer audiences, new people who would buy it. But I think over the years, uh, what actually when I speak to my team is that my biggest achievement so far is that today, even if I spend zero rupees on marketing, there are millions of people who are actually on a daily basis searching for the brand. So that's something I think defines success the most that because there might be, especially in the fashion space, it's the most competitive space in our country. There will be like hundreds and thousands of sellers who are selling huge amounts of products and making huge loads of money as well. 
but uh, they don't have a recall so so that's that's a difference between an enterprise or a and a brand right so i think for us the biggest achievement has been that we've been able to kind of build a brand from scratch where millions of people are shopping with us and we have actually the highest uh, uh, loyalty rate as well in the industry today so so that's i think been one of the major uh, very interesting so share with us some initial teething challenges uh, which you think were you know very very important for you to cross those hurdles see i think uh, for any businesses uh, any business uh, i think there are two to three things that of course in the last few years you would have seen that people have lost those ethos of uh, they've gone into more valuation mode uh, more uh, not making money earlier thinking that one day we'll start making money but i think today especially now that the hardships have started money has started drying up people are realizing and that's what our ethos used to be back in the day as well we always made sure since day one uh, the business has to be profitable and there were only three four metrics that we used to look at while uh, trying to build a profitable business i think one of the biggest teething issues for most businesses especially fashion businesses we see is inventory is a major problem right that how much to make and how much is enough and because we have to come up with a number which is neither less nor more because it at the end of the day affects your working capital so i think we over the years have built systems around it to understand the demand understand the uh, demand that is happening understanding our supply better we automated a lot of it to kind of come up with a number which is actually ideal of course it's an evolving process i don't think any brand in the country whether it's uh, in the world in the, whether it's zara or it's sheen i can never say that this is the right number that you should aim for but yes i think we evolved a lot over the years and those are one of the major issues that we used to face earlier either there were certain sale events where we had more inventory then there are certain sale events where we have less inventory which used to impact the overall growth of the business that is one second is of course uh, dead stock so for any brand i think for any company uh, while things might be good you might be selling well but you always have to keep track of the back end also the uh, the bottom line as well and that is majorly most of the times in most businesses hit by dead stock or thing inventory that is not selling so uh, then third another teething issue that i was facing was because e-commerce was fairly new uh, tech around e-commerce was also fairly new i mean today we have solutions like shopify and all where you know it's a plug and play system where overnight within 24 hours you can go live with the website but uh, back in the day this was not the case uh, we had to fight hard we had to build teams uh, we had to find the right solution providers today there are thousands of startups solving thousand problems it could be something as small as a search so earlier that was not the case we had to build everything from scratch ourselves today even if i tell my team yaar mujhe ek acha search dalna hai ai based search dalna hai i actually have to choose from 10 different partners 10 different startups who are already doing that payment gateways everything like i remember back in the day there was only one payment gateway option and uh, wo there was no email replies we used to get from them hardly any telephone access that we used to get so to get the payment gateway live on my website it took me 3 months so and today if i have to do that i think even with the stricter rbi laws i maximum worst case would be 7 days to go live with a uh, a uh, payment gateway part i mean the the teething issues are a lot we face a lot of issues initially and uh, yeah i mean that's how the journey has been so i can relate to that because uh, you know my first uh, uh, payment gateway enabled website was launched in 2012 Yeah. So I understand C C Avenue was the only. C C Avenue. I don't want to label it. That was the only part. That was the only part. We are, we yeah. are uh, now, yeah. you know, uh, evolved and matured as a as a as a ecosystem. So yeah, I know. I remember those days. And Blue Dart being the only to, logistic partner. Ha! Uh, and even to you know uh, get your website as you rightly said, you have to search non-technical guys. You yeah, know, you have to absolutely. search who will do what platform to use. There are no frameworks. I mean. i i can imagine so uh, you know uh, just to tell our viewers uh, you are still a bootstrap company yes we are so like i said our ethos since day one has been uh, we've been profitable starting our first transaction and uh, we've evolved as a business we've always made sure and that's also without hampering any growth so it's been nine years we've been completely bootstrap and uh, that's how i mean so uh, to all the uh, retail leaders who are watching uh, you know uh, it's uh, you can build a business large business uh, uh, just being bootstrapped so 
funding valuations as he said rightly is different so tell me one thing uh, initially you had to put in money of course and uh, you had your own money to initially put and how fast you were breaking even uh, and what was the you know uh, the the magic sauce which you used just for our other d2c startup founders see if you ask me personally honestly i did not put in a single penny in the business uh, started from scratch i think hardly 5 10 lakh rupees is something that i put in that also just as uh, basic admin cost i think uh, see that's what i'm saying that if you build a decent network over time it's not just money i think for me my investment was that my relationship and negotiations with my suppliers i felt that played a huge role uh, i actually went to them the first question i used to ask them was that here i am starting something new you i'll need your support for the first one one and a half years and once it gets evolved i'll pay it back uh, in my own way and i used to only work with uh, vendors and uh, people who who actually gave us a decent credit period like a 60 90 days uh, kind of a credit period so that that was i think that is the investment for me that is actually a vc funding for me to be honest that my suppliers were my vcs uh, at the time they were my angels who kind of helped us uh, so when that happened i knew that we are smartly ordering inventory that e-commerce infrastructure was that way is very good uh, guys like mintra and flipkart were very efficient with their payments and all those things we used to get payments within a few days of uh, the sales happening so that was never really a problem and when we were paying in 60 days we could gradually kind of grow the business slowly so so honestly never not really put in too much money for it to come back to us yeah very interesting uh, so uh, you know this reiterates the fact which comes out in all mo- most of our conversations is that you know this is a era of uh, collaboration and not competitiveness right so uh, i think uh, that worked uh, well for you so uh, you know it's been 9 years uh, i think it's a long long time right and uh, i just am curious that were there moments where you thought that you know it's getting tougher see of course like i said lot of challenges came on the way but i think as a personality or as a human being i think we should realize that issues will arise things are going to be tough and we are going to face challenges right and that is the true definition of an entrepreneur without challenges i don't think uh, any entrepreneur out there i mean would say the same thing that no startup and no success can be achieved without hardships and i think it's been the exact a very similar story for us as well we faced a lot of challenges but we actually took it as a challenge every time whether it was times when uh, inventories were not selling because in fashion it, things are very like ever changing right one day fashion changes and you have like 50000 pieces of stock that stops selling that becomes one challenge for you then in terms of uh, competition kind of rising so back in the day i think we were one of the few brands i mean if you look at it right now for me after covid also uh, if before covid there were 500 brands now after covid there are 50000 brands selling similar looking products so so challenges whether it was in the early days or now i mean we face a new challenge every day but i think as brands and as entrepreneurs we actually have to outdo ourselves every time a new challenge comes in and that's how we do it as well we actually sit down on the drawing board and see what the problem is and try to get into the roots of the problem and try to find a solution and i think uh, that's played that's done really well for us and we've overcome most challenges in our uh, journey so far so this brings to my b- b- question you know b- you as an entrepreneur what do you see certain uh, you know key personality traits which you have which every entrepreneur should have i think that's my favorite question honestly can answer very easily i think the first good quality of an entrepreneur has to be that he has to be a problem solver because once you reach a stage once you reach a scale i think uh, when you start something you're doing everything yourself you are the photographer also you are the one who's setting up the studio also you are setting managing the warehouse also you are doing the packing also so i mean over the period of uh, starting out in the first one or two years if you've done everything then that means that you're a master of all those things but then there will be a time when you scale up Two three years later, when you're not doing those things, you have a proper team, you have a good team, uh, you have helping hands who kind of helping you scale that business. 
that time you your main role has to be a, a problem solver because there are going to be issues certain issues in warehousing certain issues in billing certain issues in inventory management fashion designing it could be anything but because you've actually done each and every activity in your early days there is nobody in the organization who can do it better than you no matter how experienced the person might be but in your business i don't think there can be a better master than you that's what i personally feel and i think that's what i do today so for me i think my biggest kra to say is understanding and solving problems people actually only come to me when there is a problem and they know that the way i will solve it nobody else can and i think this is the best quality that everybody every entrepreneur should if you're not a problem solver then you'll face a lot of issues along the way and and i think that's been uh, that's one learning that i would definitely like to share with everybody for sure it's a insight uh, and and uh, it, this problem being a problem solver has come out very very uh, strongly in this conversation and i think uh, it it comes from the fact that you you are not a complainer you know and Absolutely. you you uh, you know and and i think not and not think blame blame anybody so taking responsibility being proactive being the person you know who says okay this is my responsibility let me roll up my sleeves and do it myself Absolutely. right and and i personally think that that's what drives the team also that i think in my team people look up to me because no matter what the topic might be i am able to solve that problem so they actually feel that this is one of the biggest uh, i mean uh, achievements for me that i am actually able to solve so many different topics that probably people are uh, around me are not able to do that right so so i think that's why the teams also look up and they feel that they also that's why we actually encourage a lot of teams to do uh, different things it's not specific to their kra you don't have to if you're a marketer and if you have interest in other things we have programs for uh, cross uh, transferring people um, into different programs as well so so i think that that does really well for us very interesting uh, so uh, uh, you know uh, you have grown now people uh, number of people who were part of the team now would have grown so uh, talk to us about the values of you know have have those values which you hold, held initially are you able to keep those values for the organization right now because you know a lot of th- times what happens is that when you grow suddenly and at that fast pace you know somewhere the value system got gets diluted so we are actually very very strict about our principles and our value system and whatever the values and systems were on day 1 they still stand i think i just shared with you that we moved into our new office uh, this week and and the theme of the new office when we launched in was that uh, there are about 20 30 screens in the office and every everywhere we had this thing written that welcome to your new home so that was the theme of our uh, launch because since day one what we've actually tried to do is that no matter how big the team might get we've always tried to create an environment which is uh, like home or probably better than home and and we encourage activities pre and post working hours also so that people actually are i've seen that energy in people where they want to come early to us probably to us early they would use the gym facilities in the office or they'll play pool or table tennis or whatever there are multiple activities that can be done and and the kind of energy that i get and i see is that they are willing to come to work it's not something that you know they are doing by compulsion and it could be somebody as young as a fresher to somebody as experienced as working for 30 40 years uh, in the trade so so i think those are the kind of value system that we built in we are trying to create a home away from home and hopefully we've been able to successfully do that and we'll try to kind of improve on it as we g- 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 uh, go along the way yeah yeah that's so nice because you know uh, uh, a company is as good as its people i think so if if uh, everybody wants to come to the organization and put in their 100% i think that has been one of the reasons out of the many of your such uh, i see i saw a pool table here i'm being told that there's a meditation room being built so you talk to us something about that why meditation room see i felt that like i said if you're creating a a home away from home so the, on the terrace we have created one temple and there is one uh, meditation room where people can do namaz and all those things so like i said i mean all those kind of facilities you will get at home as well right if you want a peaceful space where you want to do your prayers or connect with god or maybe you're having a stressful day you just want a peaceful area to sit 
So that that's the reason why we tried to create it, and we feel that what was happening was that obviously it's not humanly possible for anybody to work nine hours, eight hours at a stretch, right, without a break. Hence, we we actually created a lot of breakout spaces within the office. It could be a small corner. We have a DIY coffee station where you know we encourage people to go have chat with your colleagues and all those things, so that your your stress is away. Right now, also, I mean, people take a break, but they are sit still sitting in their workstations or talking across. So we said that, yeah, why do that? Let's give them that 15 minutes of energizer. It could be a small game of table tennis, which kind of you know. Uh, Suddenly energizes. It's like a booster shot of Red Bull, uh, so to say. So, so that's what I felt. And since we moved into the office, we are seeing real amount of goodness. Uh, uh, I mean, helping people kind of do that for sure. Interesting. Very, very good. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, Siddhant's personal uh, daily routine in terms of you know keeping, you know, juggling all those balls and still, uh, you know, keeping his head cool. Yeah, honestly, uh, I actually like to try to kind of uh, make a routine out of my day. I I don't like to as a as a personality. I don't know. I just don't like to get away from my routine. I I want to know what I'm going to do throughout the day, and I don't like to spend time on a particular thing. Like even when I'm in office, I'm running around. I know that this is the meeting I have to get into. So even if I see so. I actually get anxiety if I have a 20 minute of free spot between my calendar, right? For example, if I'm meeting you, I've booked a slot of one hour with you. So if I if it actually gets over in 40 minutes, I actually get anxiety. अभी 15-20 मिनट में करूँगा क्या? So I actually start my day. Uh, so uh, I start my day early around 7 7:30 in the morning. Uh, drop my kids off uh, to school, and then after that, uh, I like to either read newspaper or listen to music. So I'm a passionate music listener. So that is one of my hobbies for sure, and then I have a uniform that I wear to work, which is my plain black T-shirt and a jean, so that I don't have to decide every morning uh, what to wear. My breakfast is also fixed. I have uh, an omelette every day, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays I have a paratha. So, so that I don't have to decide and yeah, choose every day. So actually, when I get ready and I want to leave for work, right, I don't want to spend more than five minutes. So I actually fix those things. And then my uh, work starts at about ten, nine thirty, ten o'clock. My calendar is set, and uh, I try to leave work as much as I. I mean, most of the days I'm not able to, but at least thirty, forty percent of the days I try to leave at sharp six o'clock so that I can meet my kids for half an hour. They go off to sleep at seven, so I have to be there at like six thirty, six forty-five to meet them for fifteen minutes. That's how my routine is. Going. Wonderful. So you know, but two things very, very starkly coming out from here is one is discipline. and the second is time management you know effective utilization of time okay. not time management but effective you know so time is the most precious uh, commodity uh, we have so you know it has been a very insightful uh, session with you siddhant you know when we talked about the uh, uh, business and the brand right building a business and building a brand right so in retail uh, parlance i mean in retail context that is something which is you know every retail leader should understand and of course we talked about the inventory the optimization and stuff like that personally we uh, you know you shared with us a very very strong uh, uh, you know uh, attribute or attitude which is like you know entrepreneur should always be a problem solver and of course uh, we got the discipline and the time uh, you know and of course people So at this juncture, I would like to call in Amisha. She will have certain questions, and then I'll come back again, and then we'll have we'll conclude this conversation. Okay. So as we talked about your business in general and your biasness towards women ethnic wear, right? So we are we have observed that the ethnic wear segment is growing, right? So and men's section is already growing. So do you have any plans to enter a men's market as well, or do you just want to be stick, be loyal to the women? so this conversation i think i think more than 100 people have asked me to you know that of course everybody thinks that the next product after doing women ethnic would be men's ethnic uh, we actually have done a lot of research we've thought about it brainstormed multiple times but that's actually not the case so actually when we sit down on the drawing board and we realize that what should be the where should the next growth come from so <coughs> what we feel is that we as a brand feel that we are a very women centric brand at the moment and if the next level of growth has to come from other categories it should definitely not be another gender 
it should be more cross categories like we are looking to launch handbags we are looking to launch accessories jewelry uh, etc because thing is that today for any brand in a competitive scenario the biggest challenge is to acquire new customer and when we say men you are actually uh, asking me to go and acquire a new set of consumer because men have never shopped from us so there could be like 8 out of 10 women might know about the brand but 8 out of 10 men won't know about the brand so after that i have to go out and spend that money to acquire that consumer whereas if i look at cross categories like the categories that i just mentioned it's a lot easier because it's essentially the same customer i'm just actually increasing their basket size so for me the obvious choice is to expand in categories would be more women centric than men centric for sure so hence uh, we've actually taken it out of our pipeline for the next 4 to 5 years at least to not do men's wear so as you have shared some you know uh, key learnings from your journey with weight sir so can you uh, t- tell us about the more ch- uh, challenges so basically the ethnic segment faces the eth- uh, the business who are in ethnic we are and you know what are the challenges you face in particular this segment see the biggest challenge is that ethnic wear as an industry for the last uh, 30 40 100 years i don't know uh, has been dominated by the unbranded segment people have their own local stores or their own key high street markets where they would really go uh, shop from uh, small vendors or small stores that are there within their vicinity not national level brands because there were very handful of very limited brands that were there so when we started it was definitely a challenge because of course when you're running an organization you're running a brand your overheads are much higher your running costs are higher so it's obviously a brand would always charge a premium for the quality and standards that we try to maintain uh, for our consumers and initially i thought that would consumers be ready to pay that extra money a they are firstly for them e-commerce is anyways new so it's going to be a challenge for them to order online plus over that also if i charge a premium over the uh, unbranded segment how is how are people going to accept that but i think over time what we realize that if you have a good product and if you have a good recall value as a brand if you're building an aspiration in the consumer that problem will never actually be a problem and uh, so yeah i think that was a very big challenge for us in the early days but we actually overcome it like i was mentioning to ved also that that has been our biggest achievement today people are buying us for being us it's not just the product that they're buying it's actually they're buying a brand so they feel good about it so so i think that's been one of our biggest achievements uh, over the years so now that you know that we are living in currently living in a digital age and everything is all, almost ai so what are your plans uh, how are you going to incorporate ai into your business in terms of anything maybe a business marketing strategies like anything if uh, i were, we are would like love to know about that so i think ai as it is is going to take over our overall way of working in the next 3 to 4 years right and it's already begun uh, we see that everything starting from marketing to production planning to merchandising in stores to catalog shoots i think we have already starting ai in so many different domains and i feel that we are only 10% of at 10% of the potential as at the moment so i'll start with a few categories right so the biggest challenge for us was that we are at multiple shop and shops uh, we have 500 600 plus shop and shops now, now like lifestyle shop and stop and all and to manage 600 sh- and we've only scaled that up in one year so of course for a new brand your bandwidth is limited uh, so the obvious mistake is that you will be sending the wrong products at wrong stores not replenishing them properly so we started hiring and we realized that at this speed we'll need at least 20 30 people to kind of make sure they service 600 stores properly so then we sat with an ai based company and we said this is the problem let's solve it so we went came together we actually sat on the drawing board again we said that this is the problem statement and we have to solve this we build a solution within 6 months where now uh, looking at the past year sale trend the system ai tells us that there is a store in the south which does not sell yellow or for ex- just giving an example so it will actually run the algorithm so if i have to say send new merchandise to a store in bangalore so i just have to put in the name of the store over there and i have to show my current inventory algorithm with and it will run its algorithm within 30 seconds it will tell me that which are the 500 pieces that have to go to that store so an activity which was very inefficient till 6 months one year back is now actually automated so when i'm doing inventory planning for 500 store it's actually the algorithms are run, being run in 30 seconds and my decision making is happening by one person in 30 seconds 
So that's how AI is going to dominate over the next few years. Okay. So uh, now you know we are also now we talked about AI and this sustainability angle is also that you know every brand is expected to be more sustainable towards the environment. So what are y the practices you are doing to you know be sustainable as a fast fashion brand? So I know that whenever I, I get this question asked a lot and obviously I feel that whatever I say I will sound like a hypocrite because I am running a fast fashion brand. Uh, however, we are taking a lot of steps uh, towards sustainability. Like the office that we are sitting in today, this is a new building, it's an IGBC certified building and uh, uh, we are, uh, sorry not IGBC certified but we are in the process of getting it IGBC certified and uh, the theme of the office is sustainability. Everything that you see is most of the stuff is made out like uh, I think you see this chandelier on top of us, right? So it is completely made out of waste fabric that was left out. So we've been collecting this over the past one, one and a half years where we call it katran, like the small pieces of fabric that are left out in factories. And uh, we actually uh, created like 100 gunny bags full of this fabric and we've used and we collaborated with an artist who created art all around this uh, waste fabric. All the materials that you see are all green certified materials that we've used starting from something as small as a tile. Yes, in terms of fashion, we are still a fast fashion brand, but yes, we are taking that move towards sustainability. We have a small capsule of collection which is more on handloom based using materials like khadi etc which are more reusable and I think sustainability is a process. So we feel that today we are starting and in the next 5 to 10 years we'll be shifting it's not something that as a brand or any brand can you know do overnight that, that's what most people have taken a pledge that we'll do it by 2030 and i think we are also in the same boat that uh, we we know that sustainability is the future and to have a better future for our children we have to make sure that we do the right activities that's great you know so uh, i would uh, i'll just you know conclude this uh, from my way then i will call wait sir again so uh, as we are talking it's the festive season around the corner. So, what are your expectations just for the festive season this year? See, I think uh, festive season for any brand is, I think this is the biggest period of the month. We are extremely excited. We are seeing a lot of new trends picking up, people wanting to buy more fusion stuff. And, and I think this time, Diwali being a little late, uh, I think this just always extends the festive season because no matter when the actual festivities start, October is the month of festivities. So when Diwali actually happens in November, we get 42 days of festivities like we are getting this year. If it's on 20th of October, then the festivities are limited to 20 days. So I think, I think uh, we are very, very excited and we are very positive for this festive season and uh, we have a great outlook towards this. Uh, I think thank you so much for answering my question thank very you. patiently. I would like to welcome Vetsar again and continue the conversation thank and you. enlighten our viewers. So Siddhant, uh, we would like to now conclude the uh, conversation in uh, by, you know, uh, this is what I ask all leaders, you know, some of it has come out in my conversations with you and with the Amishas. Uh, we talk about four P's of business, right? People, profit, planet. <coughs> so, <coughs> out of those four P's, you know, which one do you think is core to you? Purpose, profit, planet and people see i think for me it has to be both profit and people I, sorry sorry my bad purpose and people i meant uh, so for me i think uh, purpose is something that is at the highest priority when you start a business when you don't even have people because purpose is actually defined before you actually start building a team because it starts with the concept i think that's very important because the purpose and the vision has to be right for any entrepreneur because that's what you're at the end of the day waking up for every day, right? And, and that's what it was that I, when I started, I had a very clear vision of what I want to do, where I want to be in 10 years, and I knew why I'm doing this, what is the purpose of doing this. So I think that's very important. And I think second most importantly is people. That today I think uh, I, we as a brand are where we are because of the teams that we have, because the people kind of, everybody's hard work, late nights, and we know we've done all of that, like everybody, all entrepreneurs, right? So. I think for me, these are the two impo most important aspects uh, to scale up a business. And I think being bootstrapped, you can, you know, b ignore the profit part because uh, uh, any business's aim is to make profit. And, you know, when you have investors, your profit also is on the yeah. priority list. Right. 
see honestly i agree uh, we don't we've never uh, really felt that we have to go there since the beginning we've never really run after money we felt that if the product is good <coughs> if if you're doing a good job if your if your purpose driven if your vision is right i think profit is a by product right it will automatically come i agree i agree so uh, you know uh, uh it had been very very uh, insightful conversation with you uh, siddhant uh, at at such young age uh, and and you know now with the, this also uh, another thing which is coming to my mind is clarity you had clarity for next 10 years now there's a long way for siddhant to go what is your vision for next 10 years see uh I have a vision. It is already pictured in my head. I don't know how much justice I'll be able to do it over over this conversation, but I think we aspire to be the largest fashion house in the country in the next five years. Is my target. I mean, it's a ten-year vision, but yes, uh, we aspire to do that definitely by twenty, twenty-nine, twenty, thirty for sure, and that's where we want to be. And I think we are in the right direction to do that. Hopefully, we should be able to achieve that as well, keeping our fingers crossed. wonderful wonderful <laughs> lastly uh, there's a lot of talk of about esg so sustainability we talked about uh, you know uh, uh, governance uh, how how do you see uh, you know managing and uh, being uh, using the best practices and governance of the company as you grow see we are definitely since day one very very strict about uh, compliances or governance etc in fact uh, we are very very particular in the factories that we choose to work with uh, in fa- in fact even in our office you've been here we you know try to make sure that all basics necessities are covered and uh, and and i think since day one we felt that i think it's just easy for any business to operate when you th- i mean most brands run away from it thinking that it, that comes at a cost right and that's what we've seen but like i said we've never really felt that we look at comfort more than profits for sure at this stage of our life when we don't have 10 investors asking us to make money but uh, but yeah i think uh, we're fully compliant in most uh, directions and uh, we'll continue to do that and this has been the case since day one it's not something that we've uh, after scaling up we've tried to achieve that we've had that ethos since day one so no no wonderful so uh, as i said it had been very uh, interesting and uh, insightful any last words for young entrepreneurs d2c entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are in a journey where probably they are again struggling for something see i i think it's a very uh, basic feedback that i'll give to everybody out there that i think when you start out any business your ethos has to be straight that there are two things most importantly one is three actually one is the vision that has to be there since day one यू कॉन्ट बी इन अ सिनारी वेर यू थिंक आज शुरू कर लेते हैं कल सोच लेंगे कि क्या करना है दैट शुड नेवर बी द एटीट्यूड आई थिंक यू शुड नो वॉट यू आर गेटिंग इन टू यू शुड सी योर सेल्फ वेर यू स्टैंड इन द नेक्स्ट थ्री ईयर्स यू शुड नो वॉट यूर प्रॉब्लम ऑफकोर्स यू फेस न्यूर प्रॉब्लम बट यू शुड रियली नो दैट दिस इज इफ यू कॉन्ट सॉल्व दिस टूडे इट्स नॉट गोट बी इजी फॉर यू टू सॉल्व इट थ्री ईयर्स लेटर सो मे बी यू आर नॉट इन द राइट बिजनेस इफ यू यू थिंक दट देर आर गोट बी प्रॉब्लम अलॉन्ग द वे सो विजन then of course product product is the most important thing no matter how much money you spend no matter what you do how many people you get if the product is not good it's not going to sell and if it's not selling in the first 6 months profitably one year profitably don't wait for 5 years uh, as thinking ki aaj nahi hai kal ho jayega that is never going to happen unit economics is extremely important for any business especially in in times where i think every product there's so much competition that there will be 10 pe- 50 people you know selling similar looking things so so you always have to try and stand out of the competition yeah, so that's, that's wonderful wonderful so i think uh, we conclude here our time is uh, over so thank you siddhant for thank you. Thank being you such a nice leader thank you thank, thank you. you and we wish you all the best thank you thank, thank you, you.